So we looked at two weeks ago in the book of James talking about drawing near to God, sort of an overview sermon uh, for this very brief series, uh, looking at the, the command to draw near to God and the fact that if we do so, He will draw near to us. And then last week, we sort of went to back to the Psalms and to see sort of a motivation of why we would want to draw near to God. And we saw the reason we would want to do that is that we have no good apart from God. And therefore, we ought to draw near to God for He is our source of good. And this morning, I want to look at Psalm 19 here to to try to answer a little bit in more detail the, the, the question of how do we draw near to God? What, what resources have the, has the Lord given to us to enable us to do that? Before we jump in here to Psalm 19, uh, join me in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful. We're thankful that You exist and that, Lord, You have not hidden Yourself from us, but You have very clearly and very intentionally made Yourself known to us. And Father, I'm thankful not only that You have made us made Yourself known to us, but that, Lord, You have given us a desire to know You, to, to take advantage of the knowledge You have revealed of Yourself, that we care about that knowledge. And Father, my desire this morning is that You would fan that desire, that it would increase and grow as we see You, Lord, speaking to us in the different aspects of your creation, your word, and even within our own hearts. And that, Father, as we see you speaking there, we're made more aware of you in our lives. And that, Lord, that speech would serve as a prompting for us to draw near to the God who is all our good. And Lord, it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning, I want to speak to you and encourage you in the direction of cultivating an awareness of God in everyday life. We've talked about drawing near to God. We ought to do it. But hopefully this morning, I want to show you how you can cultivate an awareness of God in everyday life. How is it that then God makes it possible for us to live with an awareness of Him every day. And as we become aware of Him, that that would serve as a prompt to draw near to Him. How is it that God makes it possible for us to live with this awareness of Him every day? Well, in this psalm, Psalm 19, there are really three fairly clear sections. It becomes very clear if you read this a number of times, and maybe you caught it in your first reading there, that this psalm breaks in into three different sections. And each of these sections presents to us a place that God is speaking to us. And therefore, it is a place that enables us and to encourages us to be aware of God every day. In the first section of Psalm 19, you see that God speaks to us in the world around us. The second section there, beginning in verse 7 through 11, is God speaking to us through the Word that is before us. And then the psalm wraps up there, verses 12 through 14, saying that God speaks to us within our hearts that is within us. So all of these places in the world, in His Word, and in our hearts, God is speaking. And therefore, these are places where we can cultivate an awareness of God, which will help us then to draw near to God. And so let's look at this first of three areas where we can cultivate an awareness of God. First of all, we can cultivate an awareness of God in the world around us. And how do we do that? Well, we do so by recognizing God in the wonder of of the world that He has created. There's an awareness of God in the world around us, and we do that when we recognize God in the wonder, the splendor, of the world that He has created. The natural world, the created world, specifically here in Psalm 19, the sky speaks loudly and consistently about God. Notice what the heavens declare there in verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. The skies, David says, are proclaiming. 
right? This isn't just some kind of soft whispering, right? Trying to go unnoticed. No, the sky is declaring, shouting, proclaiming the handiwork of God, the glory of God. It speaks loudly there in verse 1, and it's proclaiming, declaring, and it speaks consistently there in verse 2, day by day pours out speech, night to night reveals knowledge. This is an ongoing. So it's not only clear and loud, a declaration, a proclamation, but there is a consistency to it. It's not just once every hundred years the sky does this. David says day after day, night by night, the sky is proclaiming a message that God is glorious. It's making it known. So when we think about day by day, it happened this morning, and night by night, it's going to happen again tonight. Day and night, each in their own separate ways, but without fail, the sky is speaking loudly and is speaking consistently as it pours out speech regarding the glory and the artistry of our Creator. And by pointing to the sky, David isn't by any means trying to say that the rest of the earth, the rest of the natural world doesn't speak of God's glory, right? David speaks about other parts of creation glorifying God. And of course, we can look at other parts of the Bible as well. Oceans and rivers, trees, uh, you know, rainbows, all, all of the things that we can see in creation in some form or fashion, the, the scriptures speak about how they proclaim the glory of God. But here... David's focus is just on one place of speech that is going out in creation. And he is saying that there is not a a night or day that goes by where there isn't this loud proclamation that God is glorious. Now, this statement of God's glory is not in spoken words, but in light and in color and in contrast of colors and shape in the position, in motion, in the sheer magnitude and beauty of that light. And all those different ways that the light appears to us, whether by day or by night, it is speaking in its own unique way of the glorious nature of God. And in this psalm, David calls our attention particularly to the sun. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims His handiwork, I tend to think of the night sky and thinking about all the stars sort of laid out there. But that's not the route that David takes. He turns our attention and focus upon the sun. At the end of verse 4, he sort of brings some attention to that, but mainly it's the voice of the sun. He says there in verse 4, Their voice goes out throughout the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. So there is this Hear the sun, this amazing, this powerful, immense piece of God's creative handiwork. And that this handiwork, this sun, has been awed by every human being throughout the history of creation. To some point, there have been groups of people that have even worshipped the sun because of how glorious the sun is itself. But you see here... The image that David is giving there in the last part of verse 4, he says, In them he has set a tent for the sun. This huge canopy. This idea that God has sort of constructed a stadium that God has built for the sun to shine upon. Then he goes on there in verse 5, which comes out the sun like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. So you think about this bridegroom coming out of his chamber, you think of the image of joy, of rejoicing. And when you compare that to the sun with all these colors, the the pink, the purple, the bright orange layer as the sun is sort of coming out in the morning, sort sort of exiting its chamber as the bridegroom would, there's a rejoicing, there's a joy that's sort of associated with that. And then he uses a new image, not just a bridegroom leaving his chamber, but the last part of verse 5 there, like a strong man who runs his course with joy. This strong man, we think of power, we think of strength. And these verses here aren't so much trying to teach us some information, but rather it's really a, a, a time of worship. Uh, the David is exulting. He's worshiping over the, 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 the power of God seen in the power of the Son. 
David is saying that the sun is just part of the heavens. And here this sun is every day as it comes up, like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, like a strong run, it completes its course. It makes its run every day, right, from our perspective. It's doing that. And as it makes that run, as it exits, the, as a bridegroom exits his chamber, as it makes its run on its circuit, right, as the strong man does, then it's just doing what it's designed to do. It's loudly and consistently declaring truths about God. God exists. God is powerful. God is glorious. And this place in the wonder world, in the, in the, in the, the world that God has made, is a place that is designed to make us aware of God. So yes, the sun brings light, and through that process, photosynthesis, right? Well, we'll give you the whole science lecture here. We understand the sun helps to serve that purpose, and many more in sustaining light, life on the earth. But here David is saying one of the things that the sun does is it creates for us an opportunity. It points to the wonder of God. It makes us aware of Him, and when we become aware of Him, it ought to drive us to draw near to Him. The sun, the sky, the moon, the stars, the, the blue expanse of the sky, the, the huge billowing cumulus clouds in the sky, the, the northern lights, if you've ever seen those, all of these handiwork of the sky is there proclaiming that there is a glorious Creator. Right, we just sang in a song, right, there's no other whose splendor outshines the sun. And that's what David is saying here. If this sun is such a great thing, imagine how glorious the one who created it is. The one who keeps it on its course. That's what David's saying. According to Psalm 19, the skies are calling us to be aware of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies above proclaim His handiwork. Because you see, the message of the sky is about God. And we have to admit, we can't miss this point and start sort of thinking that we get caught up in the beauty of nature, right? God is not nature because God Himself made nature. We see that from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And He goes on to list those things that God created. He made it. So God isn't nature. But the beauty of nature, the wonder of the world that God has created, is there to draw our attention and focus to the glorious God who made it. So David's point in these opening verses here is, is simply this. How downright majestic is the world that God has made? And this world that has been created by God is proclaiming something more majestic than itself. It is proclaiming the glorious God who made it all. And as a result, it is calling us every day, every day, every day, every day, over and over as it exists, it is calling us to be aware of this glorious God. And not just us, it is, it is calling everyone. That's the point of verses 3 and 4. Notice what it says, there is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Everywhere this speech goes, and it goes over the entire globe, its speech gets heard. That's the point of verse 4. This voice, these words reach out to everyone everywhere that see it. We can think back on the, 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 the moon was in a, a very full state last weekend when we got our first sort of snow of the year. And it was amazing to look out and see the moon and it, it's great light that it's sort of reflecting from the sun shining and the, the snow is reflecting that back up and the beauty of that. And all the residents of Ankeny could see that. But if we're not intentional, that won't draw our attention to the glorious nature of the God who created it. We'll be amazed at the simple beauty of nature. And David's saying that that speech that I saw when I saw that moon reflecting is saying, Seth, be aware of God. Know there is a glorious God behind this, and you need to draw near to Him. That's the point. That's the way it should work. 
Because God is talking through the world all day and all night, every day and every night, everywhere in the world, David says. He is talking about his existence and how he not only exists, but he is a glorious God who exists. And he is calling on everyone who sees it to take notice of him, to be aware of him. And of all the people, we who belong to him, we as Christians should see this. And if you're here this morning and you have not come to him, to God, through faith in Jesus Christ, if you've done that and you're now in a relationship with God, right? We as those people should be more than any others being paying attention to God speaking through the wonder of the world that he has created. Because God is speaking to us every day and he intends for us to hear what he is saying. That he is real, that he is powerful, and he has made a world in which we can know him. It's an important truth. And we as Christians ought to have the best eyes to see God and hear God speaking to us through the wonder of the world that he has created. You see, nature is not there to just provide a witness to people who do not know God that there is a God. It does do that. That's why there are no sort of innocent people, right? All, of, all the world has seen that there is a glorious God through nature itself. They just suppress that truth or reject it. You can learn about that in Romans 1. But the point being is I want you to see that nature doesn't just exist to, to be a witness so that those who don't know God actually know of Him. It's more than that. It's also there for us as believers, speaking to us every day, serving as a reminder to help us live with an awareness of God every day. And as we're aware of Him, take that as a prompt to draw near to Him. Think about it. Every morning when you sort of back out of your garage, you close the garage door, you pull out on the road, and there you look, and you see the sun. And when you see the sun, it should star you. Yes, that's a beautiful picture. But beyond that... This son is declaring to me, there is a glorious God. He's speaking to me. He wants to be known by me. And I need to draw near and know him. Nature readies us and calls us to be aware and draw near to God. So that's the first area where we can cultivate an awareness of God. We cultivate an awareness of God in the world around us by recognizing God in the wonder of the world that He has created. The second area where we can cultivate an awareness of God is in the Word before us. And we do that by experiencing God in the power of the Word He has spoken. Experiencing God in the power of the Word He has spoken. So not just recognizing God in the wonder of the world He has made, but sort of seeing God, experiencing God in the power of the word that He has spoken. So we want to be aware of God at work in our lives through His Word, through the Bible, through the Scriptures. Before we look closely at this, though, I want you to notice something here in verses 7 and 11. I want you to notice something that's very important. In verses 1 through 6, David made explicit references to God. You, you see that over and over, the glory of God. And then he goes on later on, uh, he, he, they spe specifically there in verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the phrase that he uses there for God is the most general name that can be used in the Hebrew to refer to God. Right? He named God just once in verses 1 through 6. And the word that he uses there is just simply in the Hebrew, El, which is just the basic standard term for God that you can get. Very general. But now, when he moves into verse 7 through 11, six times over these few verses, in very purposeful succession, David uses the most personal name for God, which is Yahweh. A God who makes covenant with His people. A God who is, I am, and I am for you. I'm making a covenant commitment to you. And it's not by accident that He does that, because the way that you know God through nature is this general God who is Creator. 
When we know and experience God through the power of His Word that He has spoken, He speaks not as general Creator God, though He is that, but He speaks as a covenant-making, very personal, loving Yahweh. He only revealed Himself as Yahweh to the people of Israel. It's a very unique thing. And the basic form of these verses is very simple. You have a bunch of nouns that are used to name God's Word, and then you have a bunch of adjectives used to describe that Word, and then a bunch, you have some verbs at the end that are used to describe what that Word can do. So let's look at the nouns first here. If you look through this list there in verses 7 through 11, you'll notice that David refers to the law, to the testimony, to the precepts, the commandments, the fear, the rules. All of those are used to describe the Word. And they speak about the authority, the truth, the trustworthiness, the precision of God's Word, and the reverence that we should have for God's Word. And then he uses adjectives to describe this. His word is perfect, it is sure, it is right, it is pure, it is clean, it is true. And all of these adjectives are speaking to the utter reliability and dependability and the usefulness of God's word. But the main emphasis in verses 7 through 11 are on the effect, the verbs, the effect that God's word will have in our lives. It's a very compelling thing here, right? We, we, we really, at the end of this, you, you, you should get to the point like David does where we really want what he's talking about, what this Word will do. And what are the effects of this? Well, the effects of God's Word is designed to have on us when we take it are better than any of the effects anything else in life can have upon us. That's why he uses the image there, much more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than also honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb. Anything else that can affect us in this life, David's saying God's Word, His commandments, His precepts, all those different nouns he used, and how they're perfect and true and right and trustworthy, all those things, it's better to be desired than gold and the sweetness of honey. And the reason that they're to be desired more than those things is because the effect God has, word has upon us is much greater than the effect anything else that is offered to us. So we think about life. We think about renewal, the deep satisfying joy, a refreshment of our, our souls. Clearly, this is what God's word, David says, will do for us. This is God's grace to us. He has given us His Word, which gives us life, which gives us renewal. We're not going to look at all of these, but just, just notice a few of these. There at the first part, first part of verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? It revives the soul. Right? It's the exact same language that David uses in probably the most famous psalm, Psalm 23, when he says there in verse 3, He restores my soul. David says, God restores my soul in Psalm 23. It's the same exact language here when he says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul, restoring the soul. That's what God does. God restores our soul through many means, but in particular here, David says, through His Word. Getting our souls revived, right? And this is important because a lot of times I think there are phrases and through songs and different books and things that sort of communicate an unrealistic expectation of the Christian life. There, there was sort of a chorus that was popular for a while that would say, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before, right? And this would be a, a chorus of a song. And when you, when you hear that, that, that's simply not true, right? Every day with Jesus is not sweeter than the day before. The Christian life is not just one uphill climb, victory after victory, and there's, there's never any setback, there are never any obstacles that come in the way. That is, that's not how we should view the Christian life. Some days are sadder than the day before. right? Some days are blander than the day before. Some days have more fear than the day before. Some days have more anxiousness than the day before. Some days have more pain than the day before. Not every day is sweeter than the past one, right? It's not true. And so that means we are going to regularly need something to revive us, to restore our souls, and David says that's what the perfect law of God will do. It will rejoice the heart, there in verse 8. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing 
the heart. There are days where we need this in our lives because our joy fluctuates. It doesn't always remain the same. And we have an enemy of our soul whose great desire is to rob us of a rejoicing heart in the Lord. And so here is the Lord who knows us better than anyone else knows us. He knows our frame. He knows that we are just dust. And He is more caring towards us than anybody else in our lives could care for us. And here's what He says. He says, I have spoken some words for you. And I have designed these words to revive your soul, to cause you to rejoice, to create a delight in the life that I have given to you. I've spoken those. I've given these words to you so that you can be aware of me the giver of life. Verse, the last part of verse 7, he says, The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. I don't know about you, but I'm interested in some wisdom, right? I'm simple. Lord, help me to think through my life. And we need this type of wisdom because the Bible simply doesn't answer every question that we have about everything that we're going to face in the life. Have you ever gotten to the point where you said, I just wish the, the Bible was like an encyclopedia and you could look up, this is the problem I'm having, turn to page 89, you read that little thing, here's what, how to deal with this situation. We want that because we want to be able to live a life where we don't need God. But instead, God has designed it that we have to live every day with an awareness of Him and we need His wisdom in order to think through the scenarios that we face and how do we respond to these in a way that honors the Lord and is good for me and my family. I need wisdom to do that. And if I'm going to find wisdom, the Bible says that comes from being in God's Word. And so I need to experience the power of God's Word that He has spoken to me. I need to live with an awareness of Him. So we need this wisdom. But this says here in Psalm 19 that we get this wisdom through God's Word to us. Not in some specific paint by number how to live your life, how we often want God to deal with us. It's not how He does it. But He says, through my Word, I will build wisdom into you and you will become wise. Now this too is a way that we can be aware of God's presence with us. Through His Word, God speaks deeply into our inner beings. God is very personal in this speech. It's not just sort of a book that I'm interacting with here, right? This is the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. God, when we read His Word, is relating to us personally. When we speak God's Word to one another, God is speaking, if we're speaking accurately, His Word. That's true. That's a powerful truth. And in that, God is very personally making Himself known to us in His Word. And because of that, it will have a profound effect upon our lives. It will bring great benefit to our lives. We see there in verse 11, Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. So in this book, God is speaking. God is at work in His Word, making me and you aware of Himself when we experience the power of His Word that He has spoken. Therefore, if He is speaking in this Word, very personally, we should be looking to His Word and desiring it with all of our hearts. Just like we don't want to look at the sun and get caught up in the beauty of the sun, it's there to point us to God, to make us aware of Him. And the same is true in His Word. Right? So we don't want just some mere intellectual commitment to the Bible so that you can study up on the Bible and win Bible trivia if you ever appear on Jeopardy. Right? That's not the purpose of reading the Bible. The purpose of reading the Bible is to encounter the living God. This is where He's spoken. So if it's this, the personal place that He reveals Himself, then for us to not go after this word means that we are crazy. For us not to sort of approach God and Him speak to us, we're neglecting a great blessing God has designed for us in this life. So think about this. Notice the imagery that's here. More to be desired, 
are they, that is, the commandment of the Lord, the law of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the word of God, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. So we can put this before us very simply. Let's say you were to come in here this morning, and on one side we had a pallet of gold that I'd lifted from Fort Knox, right? And it's 14 karat gold, not just any gold, it's fine gold. And on the other side, we have God's Word. You can only choose one to live out your life. Which would you choose? David says, if you choose the gold, you're going to be wealthy, but you're a fool. Because you're neglecting the place that wisdom, the place where God personally makes Himself known to His people. That's the choice that we have. Now, we're not presented with that clear of a thing. What we're presented with in our lives are a lot of distractions. Chase this agenda, pursue this thing, you've got this responsibility to do, and over here is God's Word. And much to be more desired than fulfilling that agenda, or chasing that dream, or accomplishing that task, is to experience the power of God in the words that He has spoken. More to be desired is this, God's Word, than fine gold, because of the effect that it has upon our lives. A pallet of gold cannot revive your soul. A pallet of gold cannot rejoice your heart or give you life or broken your eyes to what truly matters for more than a second. God wants us, as His people, to be aware of Him every day as we experience the power of His Word that He is speaking to us. The last area where we can cultivate an awareness of God, is that we can cultivate an awareness of God in our hearts. By welcoming God into the workings of our hearts that He has awakened. Not just recognizing God in the wonder of the world that He has made. Not just experiencing God in the power of the word that He has spoken. But welcoming God into the workings of the heart that He has awakened to Himself. You see, before God gave us life in Jesus, the Bible says that our hearts, talking here not about our physical heart, but our spiritual being was sound asleep. As a matter of fact, the language is actually worse than that. It says that we were spiritually dead. Dead to God. And now, because of the work of God's Spirit in the new birth, we are awake We're alive to God. And so now we can welcome and be attentive to this desire for God and acknowledging the work that He is doing within us. We're sensitive to that. And as you read the Psalms, you you notice the particular the ones David writes, that David loves the Lord. That even when God speaks commands to David, he receives those commands as God speaking grace to him. These commands are better than gold. And just because David loves God doesn't mean that David doesn't sin. Right? Here's a man who's acknowledging God in the created world. Here's a man who is, desires God's Word more than a pallet of gold. And yet, David still sins. David still struggles with listening to what the law of the Lord says. And we see that there in verses 12 through 14. Who can discern his errors David says, declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. So if this is true of David, what are we going to do about the sin that is in our lives? Or the possibility of sin in our life, even though we love God? Now, I want to be real this morning. I recognize that not everyone here this morning loves God. Not in the sense of being in a right relationship so that you can really love Him, not for what He can do for you, but because of simply who He is. And you can really experience His love for you. Now, if that's you and you've not experienced that, a true love for God and experienced His love for you, I want to encourage you this morning to call out to Jesus. To acknowledge that when Jesus died on the cross, He was suffering for our sin. And that when He was raised from the dead, He has been given the authority to grant eternal life to everyone who will trust in Him to deliver them from the punishment their sins deserves 
and to restore them into a right relationship with God. Come to Him who can give you life, who can lift your burden and give you Himself. But for most of us this morning, we are in a right relationship with God through His Son, Jesus. And I'm speaking here to those who do love God. We love Him, we love His Word, and yet, even though there's a desire here to live for God and love God, that doesn't mean there is no longer any sin to deal with in our lives. It's present. And Psalm 19 tells us, wonderfully tells us, that there is a place that we can be attentive or be aware of or desiring and welcoming God into, and that is into our hearts. We don't have to keep Him away. We don't have to live in shame and fear that He can't enter there. No, David's saying, David is bringing the Lord into this. Who can discern His errors, Lord? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. David's not afraid to lay his heart bare before the Lord. When he uses the phrase there, hidden faults, this could be sins of weakness that are sort of inadvertently done, or it could be sin that sort of sneaks up on us and causes us to do things that we don't want to do. Or it could be sins that are so a part of us that we don't see them, even though everyone else sort of can, and they're clear to the Lord. It's too much a part of us for, even, for us to even notice that we're doing it. So you have this idea of hidden sins, and then in verse 13 he says, Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Sins that we can more easily recognize. Not necessarily super bad sins, as sometimes we often want to talk about that, but any sin that is committed with a true knowledge that it's wrong. Right? I know this is wrong, I know I shouldn't do it, but it doesn't matter, I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. That's a presumptuous sin. So there are two ways of sinning David mentions here, this idea of hidden sin, presumptuous sin, and he knows that these are possibilities for him. But you have to see what he does there in these verses. He welcomes God into the working of his heart. He, he is aware of God there, and so he says regarding his hidden sins, God, please show me your mercy. Cover me, acquit me, declare me innocent, he says, based on my faith in your promise. You are the covenant-keeping God. That's always behind these psalms. God's made promises to His people, and David's trusting in that. And regarding the possibility of presumptuous sins, he says, Oh Lord, protect me, guard me, guard me from, you know my waywardness, help me, prevent me, stop me. Keep me close to you, Lord, and away from these sins. Here, David is not ashamed of the Lord to invite him here. He's calling upon the Lord to be active in his heart. The heart that God has awakened to him. Like David, we want to engage God with all of our heart. We want his engagement with us. We know we need his protection and his guidance and his mercy. Look in verse 14 as David cries out in prayer, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. There's hidden sins, Lord. There's presumptuous sins. I've got a track record. And so what does he do? He doesn't run from the Lord. He calls out to him and he says, Lord, let that which I speak and let that which I meditate upon in my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord. What? My rock and my redeemer. You see, David is fully aware of God, and he is welcoming God into the working of his hearts. And like David, we call out, O oh Lord, you are our God. You are personal. You are relational. You are our rock. You are the place of refuge that we run to, our strength. And you are our Redeemer. You are the Savior, the one that delivers us from our hidden sins and our presumptuous sins and the dangers that surround us in this life. You see, all that God is for us, He is for us in and through Jesus. He is only our rock and our redeemer because we are connected by faith to Christ. And here in Psalm 19, we see a wonderful song. And I've tried this morning to show you that its basic message is that God wants you to cultivate an awareness of Him in everyday 
life. He so wants you to be aware of Him every day that He has spoken to you through the wonder of the world that He has created, saying, pay attention to me. He has spoken to you through the word that He has placed before you, saying, be aware of me. And He is speaking to you in your heart as you wrestle with sin that lays there. He's saying, don't close me off. Be aware of your need for me, even in your heart. And He will be that for you if you look to Him as your rock and as your Redeemer. It's in Christ's name we're going to close out in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank You. We're thankful that You provide that place of security as our rock. And Father, we're thankful that you redeem us from our waywardness. We don't have to hide from it. You've entered into our world to deal with it. And you have completely in your son, Jesus. And Father, this, this day I pray, Lord, that we would, we would be a people who live every day with an awareness that you exist. That we would use these promptings that you've given to us in your world and in your word and in our hearts. That Lord, we wouldn't, we wouldn't live one single day without being aware of you. And that Lord, when we become aware that we would, as your people, draw closer. Draw closer. Near Lord to you. Father, use this word to, to create that desire, to stir that desire, and to sustain it as we seek to follow you this week. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.